I am co-president of the Gaucher Community Alliance, and I'd like to welcome you all here today. We have a wonderful webinar this evening. I think it's evening for everyone, though I'm not sure. Um, it's uh, Gaucher Disease Type 1 Gene Therapy Trials. Um, it's going to be a very exciting meeting. We're going to be able to compare a couple of the trials for type 1 Gaucher gene therapy that are recruiting for patients right now. I'd like to pass it over to my colleague and co-president, Aviva Rosenberg. Uh, Aviva, thank you so much. Thanks, Cindy. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I believe this is the first collaborative webinar between the International Gaucher Alliance and Gaucher Community Alliance. My name's Aviva Rosenberg. I'm co-president of GCA and vice president of the International Gaucher Alliance. So I'm really thrilled to be doing this in partnership. And I think it's a great way to reach much of the international community um, with this collaboration. So um, I'm, we're gonna go get right into it. I'm going to introduce both of our speakers tonight, and then I will turn it over to them um, for their presentations. And while they're presenting, if any questions come up for you, if you think of any questions, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A function, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the program. So if you have questions, go ahead and ask them, and we will get to you. So our speakers tonight, our first speaker from Freeline is Dr. Pamela Foltz. Dr. Foltz has 25 years of biotech and pharmaceutical experience leading and driving clinical, medical, and regulatory activities from trial design and execution through product approval and commercialization. She's been with Freeline since November of 2021 as their chief medical officer. Prior to Freeline, Dr. Folds worked in rare disease in multiple companies, including early work on Gaucher at Genzyme. She received her Bachelor of Science in medical degrees from Georgetown and trained in neurology at Stanford University Hospital. For Prevail Therapeutics, Dr. Sarah Newhouse is the medical director of two ongoing clinical stage AAV9 gene therapy programs. Proceed, which is a clinical trial for adult patients with Gaucher disease, and Provide, which is a clinical study for pediatric patients with Gaucher disease type 2. Sarah received her medical degree from Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. She completed her child neurology training at Duke University, followed by a combined clinical research fellowship in neuromuscular neurology and neurogenetics at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and the NIH. So thank you both to you for joining us this evening. And um, I believe that Dr. Foles is starting us off. You're on mute. You're on mute. There we go. I apologize. So thank you, Aviva. Thank you, Cindy, um, so much for having us. Um, I know uh, Sarah and I, we, we've, we've worked alongside each other for quite a while now, so it's really nice an opportunity for us to come and talk with you. Um, I'll talk a bit about the Freeline program. Um, in Gaucher disease type 1 is called the Galileo 1 trial. Um, and I'll start with a little bit of a background on um, Gaucher and why gene therapy works um, in theory and what we hope to test and why we think is going to be very successful and very promising for many patients. So importantly, um, I just really want to highlight, of course, that I work for Freeline and that um, our product is not approved. So we are very much still in the investigational um, area, um, and that's really important. So feel free, clear to ask us questions, but really urge you to speak with um, your physicians, your healthcare providers, with any further questions you might have about programs such as these. So starting off, you know, you know Gaucher and you know Gaucher disease type one, but really setting the stage is highlighting is highlighting the fact that within Gaucher disease type one, you have an alteration in part of your DNA. Um, and what occurs there is that your cells do not make enough of a particular protein, and this in this case, uh, G case. Um, and this protein or enzyme helps and does break down harmful fatty materials within cells. That is this natural work process that it does. And what happens in Gaucher is that without this enzyme, these harmful substrates build up within the cells and they start to cause damage. And if you think about it in a way, you look at healthy function, you see normal breakdown of cells and normal breakdown of cellular material. 
Um, but when you have reduced or absent enzyme, that material starts to build up within cells. And one simple way that you could look at it is uh, thinking about the enzyme as a hammer. Um, and so when you have enough enzyme, it is able to break down any buildup, which is represented here as a brick, and break that material down and keep the cells nice and healthy. What happens when you don't have enough of that enzyme, represented by this small little hammer, is you get this buildup, and you get this buildup within cells throughout your body, and that really can cause a, quite a bit of damage, as you're aware. And so what this can look like, it manifests differently in all patients, but in general, it manifests as an enlarged spleen or liver and damage there. You can have impact in your bone, whether that's pain, or whether that's damage or fractures. You certainly can see some impact in the bone marrow. You can see reductions in blood um, clotting factors. You can also see some lung problems. And so this can really hit a lot of different areas of your body, and clearly it can can cause fatigue and a lot of other issues as well that you know much better than I do. So looking at current therapies right now, enzyme replacement therapy or ERT is um, widely used and many of you know it well. Um, and it has been a big, big important impact to the Gaucher community, of course. And what it does with, the, um, with an infusion, it replaces that missing enzyme. And so you receive it every two weeks or so, depending, of course, on your, um, on your work with your physician. And you receive that enzyme, it is taken up by cells, and it breaks down the substrate within those cells. Now, it is an infusion for most people every two weeks, and it is a lifetime of continuous treatment. If you were to stop enzyme replacement therapy, which unfortunately had to happen at some time in the past when there was a drug shortage, you can see the disease come back and some of the effects come back. The reason has to be given every two weeks. It has a very short time within the bloodstream and within the cells itself. And so it is cleared quite rapidly and so needs to be continuously given over time. Another important treatment is the oral therapy, is the substrate reduction therapy. And this works on the other end. Instead of adding enzyme to your body to help break down the substrate, it reduces how much substrate or that harmful material is made in the first place. And this is an oral pill, um, once a day, twice a day, three times a day, obviously depending on, on the product you're on. It also is a product you take uh, for a lifetime. It may not address all aspects of your disease, and we certainly have heard that some patients do have some unpleasant side effects. And so while these products have made a very important impact in the, in the life of patients with Gaucher disease type 1, um, there are still some unmet needs. Patients still have um, some disease. Some patients might still have reduction in their platelets and have some bleeding. People might still have pain. They might still have lung issues. And it varies really by every patient. The concept of gene therapy is something that's really intriguing as a potential future therapy. And the concept is somewhat straightforward in that what it does is it allows for a continuous delivery of the working G case into your bloodstream. Um, it is a single infusion that lasts over a long period of time that you are able to come off your enzyme replacement therapy or substrate reduction therapy. It would produce from your liver this enzyme over time, continuously deliver it into your bloodstream, which would allow it to be continuously taken up by the cells, which would allow for a continuous breakdown of those harmful materials. So what is gene therapy? And there's, there's different types of gene therapy, um, and I believe Sarah's gonna talk a bit about that. But what's really important here is um, the gene therapy, really importantly, it takes the good components of a virus. And what we mean by that is it takes the outer coating of the virus or this capsid that you can see on the cartoon on the right. It really is what houses the internal workings of whatever um, nucleic acid or DNA or material that's inside it. We keep that external capsule, but we take out the internal viral material. So you do not actually receive any actual virus into your system, and that's really important. What we do is we replace that viral material with actually the healthy G-case gene that you need. 
Um, and then we keep the outer coating, which allows for the delivery into the system. Your body then takes up the healthy gene and enables it to start working. So if we think about this um, and we walk through the steps just a little bit more, as I mentioned, currently um, in Gaucher disease type 1 and any Gaucher, the gene containing um, the malfunctioning enzyme leads to the buildup of harmful substrates. What the products do, the gene therapies do, is you give, again, a simple infusion, usually by blood, a vein in your arm. This does not require conditioning. This does not require extensive um, preparation work like some of the other um, non-AAV type gene therapies. These are taken up by your liver cells. These, these um, genes are, these, these viral vectors are targeted to your liver. They're taken up by your liver cells. And your liver cells now house a working copy of the gene that you need. And that gene creates the enzyme and just releases it constantly into the bloodstream. And it is allowed to then circulate throughout your bloodstream, be taken up by cells, and do the job it needs to do. Now, one really important part um, that, that we like to highlight here is that this, this gene um, ther therapy, it doesn't change your genetic makeup. And that's really an important point that we have heard a number of people ask us about, that we are not replacing a gene, we're not cutting out any parts of your gene, we're simply adding an extra piece, if you will, of that healthy gene, creating the GKs that you need. And in this cartoon, it's that little red squiggle in the, in the center there. It doesn't integrate into your current genetic makeup, and so it is not passed down in any generation, if that is a concern for you. And so that is something that's pretty important, that it doesn't change your genetic makeup. It simply adds the extra gene that sits outside your, your genetic makeup to create the materials that you need. So our therapy, um, as I mentioned, um, is delivered to the liver, where it is then given into the bloodstream. Um, what's a little different is the G-case, or the enzyme that you receive, is, has some small changes to it that allow it to have a longer time to remain in the bloodstream and to remain in the cells. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the difficulties with enzyme replacement therapy is how quickly it is removed or cleared from the bloodstream and how quickly it is cleared from the cells itself. Remembering that the constant um, buildup of these harmful substrates is still happening. You always need to have the enzyme to always be clearing it out. And so having an extended duration in the bloodstream, having an extended duration inside the cells allows you to really have a nice constant and continuous presence of that enzyme that you need to continuously reduce and break down those substrates. And so that's a really important component of the gene therapy um, that we hope to see manifest. Uh, Freeline has a program, as we mentioned, in, in Gaucher disease type 1. It is called the Galileo 1 study. Um, and very importantly, it is in adults. Um, at this point, people 18 years and older, um, people who are already receiving either ERT or SRT. So we're starting with people who are not, um, who are currently on a therapy. They come in, we start at this lowest dose. Um, and you can see this low dose here in this red color. Um, as we assess the data and as we assess the patients, we have the ability to go to higher doses if necessary. The protocol allows us to expand within a given cohort. It allows us to add more patients as we deem needed. We don't have to go up to any of those higher doses. It really will come down to the safety, the efficacy, what physicians think. We have an independent committee that certainly looks at this data with us and gives us their um, thoughts as well. And so this is really important. During the course of the study, patients come off their ERT and SRT, so that we're really able to see the maintenance or improvement or durability of all of their endpoints that we'll be looking at. So importantly, we've actually now dosed four patients uh, to date in this low dose. 
Um, and we have continued to remain at this first low dose because we are very pleased to date with our safety profile as well as the early efficacy data we're seeing. So we will continue as every patient comes along to continue to look at our data set to see if we should stay at this dose or if we should potentially go up or potentially even go down if we need to. A really important component um, part of this is along with the infusion, um, within, this, uh, within this program, uh, patients will receive oral therapies to prevent an immune reaction against the therapy. Um, people will take this oral therapy beginning around week three after you receive your IV infusion. And then depending on the size of the patient, depending on uh, discussions with your physician, you'll take that over a number of weeks. Um, where you will slowly go down on the dose over time. And this is pretty important to understand as it is a key component of the study design that you will be taking this medicine. Um, and it's really designed to help reduce any reaction your body has to this material that is given to you. So there's a lot of criteria for getting into the study, but some of the key ones are, is clearly having a diagnosis of Gaucher disease type one, being an adult, already being on ERT or SRT. And very importantly is we will do a screening test if you're interested in the study, or your physician will do this test, where we'll see if you have been exposed to that capsid that surrounds the, 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 the new gene that we're giving you, the new gen genetic material we're giving you. There are many patients who have been exposed just in your daily lives to this outer capsid. It's a fairly common viral capsid that pe people have, don't feel sick, don't even necessarily know they've been uh, exposed to it. But if you have been exposed to that, then your body would react to us giving you something with that same capsid back. So we have to do that test first to see if you have any pre-existing antibodies to that. And that's an important first step to your eligibility to come in. Some other important ones I just wanna highlight that certainly have been asked um, to me uh, other times is right now in this study, we do not include people who had a partial or a total splenectomy. Right now we are looking at patients who have a full spleen, so that's important. Um, people also, as I mentioned, have to be on somewhat of a stable uh, ERT or SRT. And how this will work is you have a screening period, and this period can last up to multiple, multiple weeks, as long as it takes really for you and your physician to go through the material, to really talk about it, to draw some labs, to see if you really are right for the trial and if the trial is really right for you. So this time period can vary depending on how long um, you and your physician wanna to take to get this work done. And of course, really importantly with any clinical study, you are always able to sign up and then change your mind before you receive any products. That is always possible in any clinical study that you can withdraw your consent and have no detrimental effect whatsoever from anybody. The treatment period is mentioned here as four days. And what I really highlight here is that the dosing is a single day. Now within a clinical study, that tends to be a few hours that you get to the site, you get settled in, make sure the paperwork is ready, you receive the infusion over about an hour, um, and then you stay there for a bit, just make sure everything's going okay. And over the next few days, you will be seen for those first few days every day to make sure everything is okay, to draw some blood values, to make sure everything is working okay. And we work with the centers to ensure that patients have the ability to stay in a hotel if they want to, if they're not local, and we work with the center to make sure that patients and their families have adequate support during these time periods. Then over the course of about nine months or so, you're followed. And we'll go over a bit about what happens in that time period. But over the course of that time period, we draw bloods, we look at different findings, we ask you how you're doing, clearly look to see um, any safety issues, any concerns. Um, and really importantly, we will be checking up with you, the physicians will be checking up with you to check see if there's anything going on. Really importantly, too, is that we know that um, clinical trials can be uh, very time consuming. 
And so we do provide access to home health nursing for some of these lab values and follow-ups so that some of it can be done in your own home versus having to come into the office all the time. And so that's an important component to consider as well. And then after this nine month period or so, this 38 weeks, uh, patients are followed up over an extended period of time for at least five years. And that is actually a requirement from regulators to ensure that we follow the safety data out for as long as we can, it's, um, a really important uh, component of all clinical trials. At that point, there are much less study visits, this much more infrequent and much more easy to, um, to center your, your lifestyle around. So what will we assess? Um, we assess multiple blood tests. Some of it to look to your liver, some of it to look at your platelets and your hemoglobin, making sure um, you're safe and your blood values are looking good. Uh, in the beginning and then slowing down um, after a little bit of time, clearly we do physical exams, vital signs, looking for side effects, of course. We'll be measuring the amount of G case in your blood and in your blood cells, and that is through a blood draw. Um, to see really that your liver is making the enzyme as it should be and that it, your body is, is taking it up from the cells. Every four to 12 weeks or so, we'll also check on substrate levels. So many of you may know these terms of chitotriosidase or lysoGB1. We'll be looking at those. They are markers of efficacy. We'll be doing MRIs to look at your liver and spleen. We'll ask you about fatigue and pain, we'll look into lung function. And then also we'll be looking at uh, impact on bone. Um, and so there are multiple tests and this will be really important as if you consider clinical trials to understand truly the, uh, the duration, the amount of testing that's gonna be done. But this is really important because as I said earlier, these are not approved products yet. Um, we feel quite good about um, the data we have to date, but it's still early. And so it's important that we collect this information. So we were very excited. Um, about a month ago now, we presented um, our first set of data at um, a medical congress, and I'm able to share a little bit of it with you here. At that point, we had the data on three patients. Um, and really importantly, um, and you can see how long they had been dosed at that time point. One person was week one, nine, 16 weeks. Um, and the safety profile looks very favorable to date, which we're very pleased about. They, uh, the infusions were well tolerated by all patients without any issues. There have been no serious adverse events, which is a way of saying side effects, so nothing serious. There have been no markers of liver reaction, and that has been really positive as well. Um, we clearly do co continue to follow all adverse or side effects, whether they're related or not related to the product. Um, and we also look at, of course, side effects that might be related to these immunological um, oral therapies, too, because that's an important component. And so we've seen very mild and minimal um, side effects to date so far. Now, in the first patient, it's very exciting because we have, that's the patient who has a longer amount of data. And before entering the study, the patient had little to no G case, as one would expect to see in a Gaucher patient. And very importantly, uh, for patients who take ERT, we make sure that we assess these levels when we know the ERT is not in their bloodstream or in their cells any longer. And so we know that what we measure is from our product itself. And what we see over time is we see a really nice increase in G case levels. Uh, very rapidly, and it is sustained over time. And so in the patients we had, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the longest patient at that time point was at 16 weeks. And the patient is off their therapy, and they continue to see very nice, very durable levels of the enzyme in the bloodstream. What we also see is that we're getting it into the cells. Um, and we see that it also has been very nicely maintained and continuous presence in the cells as well. Now, the harmful materials um, that we need to break down, um, it can take a while for it to see any effect of accumulation of any harmful materials. But what we do see, and it's nice this first patient now has been dosed uh, and has had quite a bit of time of follow-up, 
is that over a, a long period of time, the patient really has started to reduce already the amount of that lysoGB1 that we've seen built up. So this patient had been on enzyme replacement therapy, was fairly well controlled to some degree, um, and we're very excited to see that there's already been now off ERT and on gene therapy, um, a reduction in that patient's lysoGB1 already over time. And so that is a really exciting early marker of benefit um, with the therapy. Importantly, off their current therapy, only having received that single infusion of the gene therapy. So summarizing a little bit, um, we do see a really nice, robust uh, delivery into the bloodstream, which is essential for getting it to the body in the first place and for dis distributing it throughout the body. We see it well above normal levels within the first week. And as I mentioned, we see it sustained over the extent of the study to date so far. We also see a really nice uptake into the cells. Um, we see it reaching normal levels by four weeks to date so far, um, and that has also been sustained over the long period of time that we've been following these patients. So we know it's getting into the bloodstream, we know it's being taken up by the cells, and we have these early signs already of potential uh, clinical impact. Patients have been off the therapy, uh, and then this one patient we had the data on, we've already seen a 40% reduction in their lysoGB1, which for some of you may know, it's a marker of disease, um, of disease. Um, and other parameters that we've been measuring, such as hemoglobin and platelets, have all been well maintained over time. And so this is a really important data set, and we're really excited to continue to follow to watch the data. So with that, I am going to say thank you very much. Um, thank you to everybody for having us, and I will turn it over to Sarah now. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Let me make sure that my all right. Let me just confirm. Can you see the full slide? Just make sure it's the right one. Okay. That looks Thank good. You so much. All right, not the presenter slide. Thank you so much. I'm glad to to build on that. Lots of exciting momentum and um information to share. I see the questions are already flooding in. They're very interesting. So um, let me move on with the additional trial that's available for patients with peripheral symptoms of Gaucher disease. I just want to give a very brief uh, overview about Prevail Therapeutics um, and, and what's going on with, um, with our, our group and our therapies at this moment, just to give a very brief overview. Um, very similar disclaimer to what Dr. Folds just shared, that tonight's purpose is, is uh, you know, two clinical trials. Um, and so what I'm talking about is not an approved therapy and so not medical advice. So really recommend talking to your providers, your, your physicians and doctors about uh, treatment if you're interested. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of, of Prevail, going to talk a little bit about gene therapy and um, uh, the different methods that are out there uh, in different trials and in the news, and then really highlight what, what both of our trials are using to, to make sure we're very clear on what they involve and, and what you would be involved in it as a patient. Um, talk about our approach, which is also very similar with some, some notable differences, which we'll highlight to make sure you guys understand the, the critical similarities and differences between the studies, and then talk about our uh, clinical trial for peripheral symptoms and peripheral manifestations of Gaucher disease, uh, which we call PROCEED. All right, so, so Prevail is really focused on um, using precision medicine and specifically gene therapy to, uh, to treat one uh, neurodegenerative conditions with one-time therapies. And I mention this because it's important to know for the community that we have three ongoing clinical trials um, focusing on that same genetic mutation that was mentioned, that GBA1 gene, and misspellings in that gene that can cause, as you know, different types of diseases, um, both Gaucher disease type 1, as well as type 2, as well as certain forms of Parkinson's disease, and that we have clinical trials in all three of those um, ongoing and enrolling um, for those listening this evening or for, for those that you know, as well as a, a separate trial in a different disease called frontotemporal dementia. But just to mention that these are, are all open and enrolling. Um, 
I want to pause before we get into the specifics of our trial and talk a bit about gene therapy um, modes or mechanisms and, and what, what we hear about and what's been available and what um, you as the Gaucher community have, have learned and, and um, heard about perhaps from other patients' experiences. Um, we want to mention that the, the goal of gene therapy here is, is as, as we discussed, really to transfer or replace or add a healthy copy of a, of a gene that's been misspelled. And so mm -hmm. I pause on that for a moment to say that a lot of things in the news about gene editing or CRISPR technology or some of these words, um, but that's not what we're talking about today, that we're talking about using um, a naturally occurring virus that's sort of functioning a bit as a delivery truck and adding an additional copy to your body to create a protein that would otherwise uh, be misspelled or misformed and not functioning properly. And then I also mention this because this type of therapy, very new and cutting edge, and our trials are, are starting and are relatively small, but that the concept of gene therapy and using a virus whose sort of evolutionary ability is to get into the body's cells and reproduce, using that technology and removing uh, the viral parts of it, if you will, replacing it with something healthy has actually been studied for a number of decades since the 1980s, early 1990s. So that this has been many, many years evaluated in the lab and animal models and different human models. So as we are learning more about it every, every day, every week, that this type of technology has actually been studied for quite a long time. And I say that because we are we are the beneficiaries of that of that knowledge of those years, working to make our treatments more specific, more safe, um, and building on those experiences. So um, many many new things in in in, uh, in science to consider. Um, so so let me walk through what we talk about when we say gene therapy, which is kind of an all encompassing term. Um, and so if we start in that sort of teal circle to the to the top left, we talk about what is gene therapy versus gene editing. And as we mentioned, the therapy or gene transfer or gene addition is really using um, our ability to deliver a, a properly functioning copy of a gene that is misspelled. Um, and that is, as, as the graphic shown before, it's DNA that lives next to the DNA in your nucleus in, in all of the cells in your body. Um, we are not disrupting or editing or changing or removing or integrating or respelling any of, of the DNA that you were born with, um, which is what gene editing would be. Editing would be changing something that are in your cells in your nucleus that you're born with. Um, and because of that, it is not something that is heritable, meaning you can't pass it to the next generation. So if you get this therapy and your you receive gene addition, um, you would not pass that on to your offspring. And so that, that is a question we get a number of times. Um, if you move one step over to the right, we talk about what is in vivo versus ex vivo therapy. Uh, both of the therapies we're talking about are in vivo, and that means delivered directly to you. The therapy is given to you in an IV form, um, in an infusion similar to what many of you may have already experienced with other types of medications, um, whereas a different trial, which, which we know is no longer ongoing, um, used an ex vivo approach, meaning that they took cells from your body, took them into a lab, modified them, and gave them back to you, um, which is a very, very different approach. So I pause there for a moment to say that both of the trials today we're talking about use that AAV virus, give it to you as an infusion. There's no um, harvesting of cells or changing of cells and, and reinfusing. Um, if we move again one step to the right, we talk about which viral vector we use. And both of us are using this adeno-associated virus. Um, adenovirus is common, typically causes a cold. Many of us have had a few of them over the years. The AAV is sort of a tiny little, almost like a surfer virus. It kind of tags on with that. It itself, there's several different types, doesn't cause an illness by itself. Um, other trials use something called a lentivirus and those have a different safety profile and different way that they work. Um, and lastly, we talk about immunosuppression. What types of immune drugs, immune modifying drugs do our trials use? And both of us are using maybe slightly different, but similar prophylactic medicines, meaning they're typically oral pills. Almost all of us use steroids, some type of steroids that are um, helpful to reduce the body's immune response. And typically one other type of immune, um, oral immune medicine that helps with a different type of immune cell. 
But to be very clear, this is not a chemotherapy regimen. This is not IV chemo drugs. These are not drugs that cause, um, you know, skin and hair and other types of changes. So we just take a moment to say that these are the four things um, that our trials do do share in common um, that are that are critically different from some of the trials um, I know the community has learned about, and and really a different experience as a patient in terms of the burden the burden on you, maybe inpatient hospital time, and those things. So with that, let's move forward on to some details about how the therapy is actually delivered and, and where it gets to. And I use this drawing to sort of make the analogy that, again, the virus we use is like a delivery truck. And it's if you celebrate the holiday season or just enjoy the Black Friday sales, I make the analogy to sort of a delivery truck where um, we might be using slightly different delivery trucks if it's UPS or DHL. But the goal is to get that that DNA into the nucleus as a separate package. Um, and you'll see to the bottom left that DNA that's misspelled, um, that our package of DNA sort of lives next to it in the nucleus and is delivered. Um, and so that is the uh, uh, effective way that we're able to, to add another copy and, and make a properly formed protein, which in this case is the G-case or glucocerebrositis that is, that is not functioning properly. And so keep that sort of visual in mind of this package and this uh, delivery truck. So let's talk about proceed. And I'll, I'll mention here as well that our, our trial, um, one way it is a touch different is that we are accepting patients with what we say are peripheral manifestations of, of Gaucher disease. We know more and more that patients um, with Gaucher are, are quite a spectrum. Um, I know this is discussed a lot more in the, in the pediatric and young adult community with type 3 patients, that there's a real spectrum of disease between type 2 and type 3. Um, and that is the case for type 1 as well, that there are patients that technically have mild neurological symptoms and have a diagnosis of type 3. And for our study, for Proceed, that would not be exclusionary. I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. We would need to assess the symptoms that you have, but um, the, the main thing we're working are patients with GBA1 mutations, with Gaucher disease, um, and who have peripheral symptoms, who have symptoms in their spleen, in their liver, um, uh, bone, bone manifestations, bone symptoms, and, and blood count symptoms. Um, and so I would just encourage you to speak with your doctor, with a, with a site, if you're interested, if, if you think that that may be, um, uh, may be the case, and, and you may consider participating and, and see if you're eligible. Um, let's move forward with some, some high-level study details. So what, what is the point of our study? As, as all of us are, are discussing, the point of any sort of first-in-human clinical trial is to see if the, the, the drug that we've created is safe, to see if this gene therapy is safe, to see if it's the right dose, to see if it does what we, what we want it to do, what we think it would do, um, but mainly just to see if it, if it is also safe to be administered. Um, and as mentioned, we are required for any gene therapy study to follow the patients who get the gene therapy for five years. Um, and so the duration of the trial is five years with the first year, the first 18 months maybe being the most involved um, and visits after that spacing out and being a, a, a bit easier to, to continue with. Um, they're, they're pretty small studies if you think about other clinical trials having hundreds or thousands of patients. Um, similarly, we're looking for 18, I'm sorry, 15 total participants between the ages of 18 and 65 and are uh, hopeful to open around eight international sites, which we're still working on as well. Um, as mentioned, it's a one-time treatment and we use the AAV9 vector. So it's a bit of a, a, a different vector here. So when we talk about delivery trucks, Ours is the AAV9, um, and again, targeting those peripheral manifestations, meaning in outside of the brain, outside of the nervous system, uh, those symptoms, um, with a single IV infusion, um, typically given in a hospital setting, and we use the prophylactic immunosuppression. So what are our key inclusion criteria? We, we do have 18 to 65 um, as an upper age limit for ours, and as well as a clinical and genetic diagnosis of GD1. And we mentioned GD3 is not exclusionary as long as you have peripheral symptoms. Um, I would say severe neurological symptoms, patients that have you know severe seizures and those types of things um, would unfortunately not qualify, but I would encourage to discuss with your provider on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, our study requires patients on baseline therapy as well, so either ERT or SRT, as Dr. Folds mentioned, for, for a minimum of two years. Um, we do know that patients change therapies 
quite a bit. They can for, for side effects or different reasons. So you don't have to be on the same therapy for two years, just on something. So if you have switched different types of ERT or from ERT to SRT and back again, for example, that is okay. Um, any combination. We just want you to be stable on something that's working for you um, or, uh, or minimally working, I should say, for about three months prior to, to starting the study. And, and then we also require sort of additional, additional evidence that despite trying these therapies, there's, there's something that isn't working quite well. So despite being on standard of care, you've tried ERT maybe a few types, you've tried SRT maybe a few doses, um, you still have some symptoms that aren't quite responding well. And that could be the size of your spleen, the size of your liver, could be the platelet counts, which we call thrombocytopenia. If you still have low platelets, that can be a struggle sometimes. And then as mentioned, bone, bone problems. People still have um, bone findings on imaging, uh, bone crises, certain amounts of bone pain or uh, bone thinning, osteopenia. So those are sort of um, descriptions of what we would say are suboptimal response to standard of care. Um, and, and those would be required to participate. Um, these are these are things that we've worked through with our with our regulatory agencies. We recognize that um, it, it can be challenging, and we're hoping to be more inclusive and take uh, additional patients at one point. But um, uh, this is sort of the, the the criteria that we've we've worked out with our regulatory uh, oversight bodies, and um, are hoping that we can broaden this in the future. For the exclusion criteria, these are important, and I think we have talked about this a bit. Um, thank you as well for mentioning in the previous presentation is drugs that are given, gene therapies that are given IV into your body. Um, as we mentioned, your body doesn't really know that this virus is a good virus with a good DNA that we're trying to help. Your body has evolutionarily developed um, these immune systems and these safety systems to recognize anything foreign that could be attacking and create antibodies against it. And for that reason, um, if we're giving you a medication that has a certain virus and your body has an antibody against it, we, we worry that it wouldn't be as effective as it could be. Um, and so for that reason, we test patients. And if you have antibodies against this sort of cargo or the delivery truck, I apologize, not the cargo. That's an important distinction. If you have anything against the delivery vesicle, um, that would be exclusionary. And so that's why, why we check those. And, and as mentioned, other than sort of age and, and genetic diagnosis would be the first thing we would check to see if you're eligible for the study. Um, we do give immunosuppressants. So if you have any known um, severe adverse reactions or, or you're not able to take those, that would be an exclusion criteria. And then as we mentioned, we, we do accept GD3 patients in certain situations, but if there's significant neurological impairment, which we can assess on a case-by-case -case basis, that would be an exclusion. Um, we do exclude patients with total splenectomy because as you see on the left-hand side, we need to be able to measure your spleen as one of our endpoints. And so if you don't have a spleen and had it fully removed, um, we wouldn't be able to um, accept you. But if you've had a partial splenectomy in, in the PROCEED trial, you would be eligible with a partial splenectomy, just not a total splenectomy. Um, also, if you have one planned, if something is already surgically planned for your medical safety, that has to take priority and, and precedence over the clinical trial. Um, additionally, that goes with bone disease. We know sometimes patients have uh, orthopedic procedures planned. So if you have a big surgery planned um, within six months, uh, that, would, that would not be recommended to, to try a gene therapy prior to a large procedure like that. Um, and then additional evidence of liver disease or spleen complications. That that's a very general statement. We have some specific criteria looking at your liver enzymes, um, looking at your bilirubin level, which is another way of assessing your liver health um, and assessing uh, uh, if you're uh, a good candidate. And, and I think we, we try to make these criteria a bit strict in our first in human studies. And the goal of that is always to expand in the future to additional patients. So for, for those, I would recommend um, looking at some of our criteria on detail on uh, clinicaltrials.gov and also talking to one of our sites if you're interested and you think, would I be eligible? Do I have um, liver or spleen disease that would exclude me? We have some really specific ways of, of finding that out. I think it's best to, to talk with one of our investigators and ask. Um, 
Let's review our study design as well. So very similar design, just slightly different colors and cartoon, but we're largely looking at three doses as well. And we call this a uh, dose escalation study design. So we, we aren't sure which dose is the optimal dose, um, but we have to start at a low dose and treat a minimum of three patients at that dose, assess the safety of each patient as we go, and then if possible, move to a middle dose, and if necessary, move to a high dose. I think it's important to note, these are, are what we call sequential. So they are dose escalating sequentially. Patients have asked, can I, can I start right at a middle or can I come in and start at the high dose? I think the high dose will be the best. Unfortunately, we can't. It, we have to make sure um, safety is, is really the first and foremost supreme thing we're trying to figure out. So we, we, we can't start you right away in a, at a higher dose. We have to begin at a low dose. Um, and then we're monitoring imaging, your organ imaging, bone imaging, as well as blood uh, biomarkers uh, quite frequently and following you every three months for the first year and every six months thereafter. Importantly, this is where we get that number 15 from. Um, ideally, we would test about three patients at each dose level. And then when we are um, convinced that that dose level is successful, we would move to what we're calling an expansion cohort. So six additional patients would be dosed um, at that level uh, once we find one that we feel is both safe and, and effective. Um, and that needs to be based on, on safety of the patients and then the blood biomarkers and imaging biomarkers that we are looking at. All right. I did want to mention as well, we were trailing right behind you, Dr. Fold. So we are excited to announce we also dosed a patient um, this year as well in 2023. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have any data to share with this group this evening. I am very excited and hopeful that we will get there and, and be able to share that in the very near future um, and uh, continue to, to dose our low dose cohort and, and uh, follow on right behind and see results that are as exciting as what you've seen. So really reassuring. Um, and exciting for the whole community to have uh, such good data coming to share. Um, let me review high level. What do we do for those, the visits? If, if I were to be a part of this trial, what would my visits look like? Um, I would say patients, uh, just to mention, um, I think all of us are very uh, uh uh, understanding that patients don't always live where our trial centers are. So you may need to take a day or two off of work. You may need to travel. Um, we do our best to accommodate and proactively cover, plan, and pay so patients aren't out of pocket for any travel and any stays. Um, we try to find comfortable accommodations near the center so that the visit may take um, one or two days to complete all of the assessments that that um, is feasible. And, and able. So patients have asked previously, do I have to pay for my own travel or do I have to, to put that out of pocket? These are things we're very mindful of and to the best of our ability, try to plan ahead and cover those things in advance. Um, most visits have a combination of some type of blood test, some type of questionnaire where you're asked how you're doing, how you're feeling, your fatigue. We want to know how your daily function is. And then some type of imaging, typically, whether that's your abdominal MRI or bone imaging, um, where we're doing a combination of those. Um, and you see the first three months is maybe the most intense with more frequent visits in the first week, first week two, week three, month one, month two, month three. And then after that, spaced out every three months. And after that point, every six months after the 12 month visit. Um, we also mentioned here there are oral prophylactic medications. So what is that? Prednisone, steroids, those are the medications that we use. Um, and there's a second medication we use as well that works on a different type of blood cell, the T cell. So in addition to steroids, we have a different um, T cell medication that's used as well. Um, and then we try to stop the background ERT therapy. Um, we, give the, we give the gene therapy a few uh, months to work and try to remove that background therapy at the month three visit to see uh, how all the levels um, are holding up and watch things closely. So typically uh, the visits take, we've, we've been asked how long do these take? It depends on the center. It's hard to say, every office is a bit different. Um, sometimes you can get in and out in a number of hours. Sometimes typically scheduling the MRIs are the most time intensive. So those are a bit hard to predict, but we've tried to um, do our best to sort of estimate how long that would take. Um, we know it's a, an active community, uh, hardworking, have lives, have kids, have families, have things, have travel. So we're very mindful of that um, when you're participating in the studies. Um, all right, so let's move lastly, just, just to review primary endpoints, what are we looking at? Safety and e efficacy is paramount, that's first. We look at disease biomarkers, as we mentioned, we look at G case levels, we look at that toxic substrate that 
glucosal sphingosine inclusive are also called lysogb1 we look at your blood counts platelet and hemoglobin we look at your organ volumes um, are they are they getting better um, even better than they were only on ERT and SRT? We look at your quality of life, your energy, fatigue, and importantly, bone and lung disease. As we've mentioned, areas that that ERT and SRT haven't been able to penetrate and 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 fix as well. Areas of unmet medical need. Um, so these are really the things we're focused on um, to give us the answers to see if this gene therapy is working. Um, and with that, I will just mention here that we have uh, four sites open right now just for this crowd. I know we're on the other side of the hemisphere. So we have two East Coast sites open in Virginia and in North Carolina um, with two additional sites in Spain. Um, and we'll be happy to share as soon as we have additional sites open um, as, as that happens. We know that's been slow and steady for all of us this year. So uh, we'll, we'll keep going with that and then look forward to the questions. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, we have a lot of great questions, so we do have to stop right at the hour due to the translation, but um, let, I'm just going to jump into it and uh, and we'll see how far we can get. So let's a little bit, a bunch of questions about the, the kind of immunosuppression. So first, why does it, so for Freeline, why does it start at week three and not week one? Can both of you, can both of you name the type, the drugs that you're using for immunosuppression? And um, and finally, the question is, why do you think you can stop the immunosuppression after a certain amount of time? So let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. So um, so the immune suppression. So um, Dr. Newhouse uh, mentioned prednisone. So we also utilize prednisone within the Freeline program. Um, and I did see pop up with the, the little Q&A section about dosing. Um, so it's based on your weight. So your dosed one milligram for every kilogram you are. Um, and so it is an oral oral therapy. And so that we do have prednisone and prednisone has to be tapered down over a fairly long period of time, which is why in both programs, you see a fairly long duration of taking the immunosuppression. A lot of it's because it just takes a while to reduce and taper you off that therapy. Um, the other medication in Freeline, um, and Dr. Newhouse mentioned from her side, ours is a therapy called tacrolimus. Um, again, it's an oral therapy, and it also it 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 controls your immune your immune reaction in a different different way. Now, importantly, is that as you talk with your physician, every patient may have some variations. Um, whether you have some you know baseline bone disease that the physician wants to be a little more careful of, maybe wants you to be on a little bit longer, maybe wants you to be on a lower dose. So there's some, some changes into that dose you're given uh, based on your discussion with your physician. Um, Freeline starts ours at week three. And really importantly is that the whole field of gene therapy is figuring this out <laughs> together. Yeah. Um, and you'll see this not only within Gaucher trials, but hemophilia trials, um, a lot of the neurologic trials, there's all have a little bit of a different um, immune response, uh, immune uh, management, and we're all learning from each other. And the regulators are all learning from all of us. And so our theory is that um, your body doesn't actually have that kind of reaction to the to the um, substance until about three weeks in, um, you know, and so far that has worked out well for us. Again, we're all learning together and whether we all end up in the same place or not, we'll have to we'll have to see where that goes. Absolutely. So I, I would just jump in and say we we have a slightly different um dosing regimen, but again, very similar. So we we do 30 milligrams of prednisone um, and we use similar to tacrolimus, we use something called serolimus. So it's just different types of immune cells you have in your body. Steroids work on some of them and these are um, T cell agents. They're different medications that work on a slightly different um, uh, immune cell. I think as mentioned, um, we're giving your body a virus it doesn't know it's a good virus. It's doing what it thinks it needs to do to flush it out. And so to the point of why do you start them at a certain time and stop them at a certain time, all of this is based on our data and predictions of when is your body responding to them and when has your body sort of um, expelled the virus? When When is it, I don't want to say metabolized because it's not like a regular drug like a Tylenol or something that you then metabolize, but you know, you have this dose, your body gets rid of it, just like you would with a different type of virus. If you've had a flu virus and then you're done shedding the virus at a certain period of time, 
that would be the theory behind when can we remove that immunosuppression? You don't have to have it on forever and ever. Um, I think those are still really open questions, right? We're still learning um, with which type of virus, with which type of um, gene we're trying to replace. Um, those, those are sort of very subtle modifications uh, to your point, Dr. Folds, about you know what they're doing in hemophilia, what we're doing in Gaucher. So I think those are a lot of the theories behind why we start them and when we stop them. And, and that steroids and T-cell agents are two of the most commonly used. If you look at a lot of trials, they use some combination of steroids at a certain dose, either IV or oral, and then also some other type of T-cell medication. Yeah. Um, thank you. Okay, another question is, where does the healthy copy of the mutated gene come from? So it is um, established through the manufacturing process. So the manufacturing process um, localizes the healthy gene. Um, it grows it, if you will. Um, and then it is packaged into this um, delivery truck, which is a great, a great way to phrase it. So it is established, um, but it is human. That's really important. If that wasn't clear, it is yeah. definitely the human yeah. gene. Um, and it is packaged within that delivery truck um, in the lab. And all of that is very, very heavily managed and monitored by the regulators. There's very high requirements um, that need to be met before this can even go into a human in the first place. Yeah. Yep. It can be synthesized in the lab. Yeah. Great. Um, can you explain the difference between the clinical trial phases? What is the what is the context of phase one, two versus phases three or four? Sure, I'm happy to I'm happy to to start. So I think um, uh, gene therapy may be the most unique and unusual in that we we don't tend to follow those rules very well. But I think when we talk about what is a phase one trial, it means it's never been in a human before. So we're starting for the first time and, and phase ones are really designed to, to identify safety. Is this safe? Um, when we talk about phase twos, it's when we talk about what is the right dose to find? And we talk about phase threes, they're much, much bigger population, um, a little bit less strict. So you see in phase one and twos, they're very narrow inclusion, exclusion criteria. We wanna be extra cautious and safe for any comorbidities patients have. We look at things like your weight. We look at things like your blood pressure. We look at things like um, diabetes or other liver or spleen diseases. So those, those trials are really designed for safety and then dose finding. And so you see in gene therapy, we say one slash two. This is a one slash two because we're doing both together. It's the first time it's been in a person and we are trying to find the dose. So I think when, when we're using those slashes or combined trial types, that's that's what we mean by that. Um, I think this is for a prevail. The inclusion criteria that you talked about, about a suboptimal response, yes. um, is that a self-assessment? Is like a suboptimal response? Like, does that mean the patient says they're not doing great on the ERT or is it a diagnostic criteria? That's a... A fabulous question. I'm so glad you asked this. So um, I would say that it's it's definitely both, but it absolutely needs an image. So many times patients and even your physician may not know. Um, we have very specific volumetric MRI we are doing. And so you may say, I'm not sure if my liver or spleen is this percent large still. I know it's better than when I started ERT, but I don't know. Um, so if you're not Sure, I would recommend absolutely getting um, uh, talk if you're interested and, and undergoing that image. It's not something you can assess or even your physician can do on a physical exam. It has to be determined um, by an image. Um, additionally, we're doing a bone MRI. Um, many patients will get a DEXA scan that looks at your bone density, um, but a bone MRI is actually more detailed to look at your bone marrow um, and look at how many Gaucher cells are really in that bone marrow. There's a whole complicated radiology scoring system for that. That's another thing that we use and look at. So I would say we couldn't know that just looking, we have no idea looking at, um, but if bone pain is an issue or recurrent fractures, those things, I would say um, consider it and, and getting the imaging would be the best way to know if you're considered suboptimal responder. Yeah. 
Okay, really quick. Um, I think someone asked about how often is this gene therapy done? So maybe just to clarify, this is a one-time deal, correct? Okay. Correct. One time. Correct. Yes. correct. And then last question. There, these are all great questions and I'm sorry that we can't get to them all. So if you, if you send them by email, then we will definitely respond. So very apologies to everyone we didn't get to. But the last question is, um, I think for Freeline, how do you, during the trial that you assess the G case in the cells, how exactly do you do that assessment? Sure. Um, and, and this is not unique to, to Freeline. So in a way this could answer for all, for all, for all studies yeah. is um, we, when we draw blood, when you draw blood to get your hemoglobin or your platelets done from a blood draw like that, you can also um, separate out some specific cells that use, that are used as a proxy and you can look in the cells that are floating around in your bloodstream. And so we can look at those cells as a proxy for what's happening in cells throughout the body. So there's no biopsies, that's a, that's a very important one. We look at it just from a blood draw cell uptake. Yeah. Thank you both so much. And these are, there's so many good questions. Um, you know, we will, this will continue to be a topic for our community. So this is definitely not the end of the discussion. Um, you know, we plan to have many more programs and many more discussions um, throughout the year, throughout 2024. We're having a national patient conference in 2024. So, you know, please, you know, if you want to join us, learn more, we'd love to have everybody there. And, um, you know, to Sarah and Pam, thank you so much for your time and your expertise in explaining this. We really appreciate it. And if, email your questions and we will make sure that they are answered and get back to you. So thank you everybody for coming and um, we'll see you all next time. Thank you thank for you. having us. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. Bye-bye.